So I am a research scientist um, with the United States government, and my laboratory is located at the National Institutes of Health, just outside of Washington, DC. In early March of 2020, I was sitting at a, in Boston, Massachusetts in the US at a conference. At the same time across the river in Cambridge, there was a meeting going on at a biotech firm, one that would unknowingly lead to hundreds of cases of a novel coronavirus infection. And by the following week, the WHO acknowledged COVID-19 as a pandemic. As scientists, we've learned a lot since March 2020. And all of us have probably learned, um, thought a lot more about our immune systems than we ever had before. Even me, and it's what I do for a living. What I want to focus on today, from the point of view of a scientist and an engineer, is how understanding our immune system and years of work led to amazing new technologies for the future of human healthcare. And ultimately, knowing what's going on in our bodies and knowing about our immune system can have even further reaching impact. Believe it or not, studying immunity and designing therapeutics to target different immune cells and proteins has led not just to advances in the treatment of infectious diseases, but also cancer, neurology, skin conditions, gastrointestinal health, diabetes, wound healing, and even tissue regeneration. As a student in an introductory immunology course, we learn about the different types of immune cells, how they talk to each other, and mostly focus on how they react to infection. Everything in the textbooks is framed around this historical context of immune cells just being our body's defense system, the security guards, the soldiers, the gatekeepers. This, of course, is massively important. People that have problems with their immune system due to genetics, medications, or prior infections with viruses that can damage immunity are much more vulnerable to infectious diseases. Throughout the course of the pandemic, diagnostics for these infectious diseases have truly jumped into the future, both in terms of tests that have been in development and seen investments to be able to be launched, as well as novel technologies. Bedside tests where science and healthcare directly are brought to the patient. When it comes to supporting innovation in these areas, it is a mix of bringing together the right people. In this case, engineers, immunologists, virologists, clinicians, and being able to support both the research and development as well as the product launch. In the United States, at the National Institutes of Health, where I work, our engineering institute launched RADx, an innovative program where there was an increase in public-private partnerships to accelerate the development of translational diagnostics, along with special focus areas, launching products that were close to market and just needed the final support to get over the line, developing brand new innovative ideas, and considerations for implementing these platforms for underserved populations. In the very near future, we could see a variety of at-home tests available. Instead of having a bug or a virus, you could actually go and test to identify what you had and what the best treatments were. Just before leaving for my flight to come here, I, had a, I learned that a family member was diagnosed with pneumonia. They were prescribed antibiotics, and whether or not it was viral or bacterial would be determined by whether or not the infection was cleared with antibiotics, because only bacterial infections can be treated with them. While at this time, without a test to quickly evaluate whether or not the pneumonia is caused by a virus or bacteria, this approach can be critical to control an infection early. If we think about bedside tests being readily available, we could avoid the overprescription of antibiotics and treat diseases in a more targeted fashion. The most vulnerable of our family members could see rapid diagnostics to identify these infections earlier, allowing for faster treatment and better disease outcomes. Rural locations can receive testing supplies that don't require an entire laboratory to run. We believe there is a future where rapid tests can be as sensitive and accurate as laboratory PCR testing, 
And we have seen data that frequent testing and monitoring for infectious diseases can drive down case rates. And as I had mentioned, early diagnosis can mean life or death for some individuals. And not just testing for diseases, testing for our body's response to vaccines can help identify individuals that may need an extra dose of a vaccine, such as those with weakened immune systems, the elderly, and the immunocompromised. Ability to create accessible, low-cost bedside diagnostics could truly revolutionize healthcare. <clears throat> The same technologies that allowed for the rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines are currently being tested for a variety of diseases, including influenza and HIV. As more platforms become available, we will have a higher likelihood of finding a vaccine platform that can treat these different infections. Could you imagine a world where HIV, malaria, dengue fever, and Ebola were preventable? Therapeutic vaccines are also being investigated to help those that are already infected. This is truly important with HIV. In addition to exciting technologies like mRNA vaccines, scientists have also been working on vaccine platforms that include multiple vaccines in one shot, both for targeting multiple diseases and by designing particles that degrade over a specific period of time so you get one shot instead of a shot and that follow-up booster. This is especially important in regions where accessing medical care can involve long distance travel and even just one visit to a clinic becomes difficult. To address the access to vaccination and this need for clinics, utilization of small patches loaded with vaccine and microneedles are being tested and could serve in the future as mail-out vaccines that don't require the presence of a healthcare provider or a clinic. It would be as simple as putting a sticker on your arm. Looking even further, scientists have designed materials that can act like artificial lymph nodes, which are the activation centers of our immune cells. They make an engineered hub to specifically activate our immune cells against infectious diseases and even cancer cells. And there leads us to another role of our immune system, monitoring our bodies for cancer. Cancer cells are our own tissue, but slightly altered. And these alterations can be identified by immune cells and removed. But when things go wrong, cancer cells can evade immune detection and grow into tumors. By understanding these phenomena, scientists have been able to make therapeutics to instruct our immune systems to fight back against cancer cells through immunotherapy. Believe it, or back, it, believe it or not, back in the 1890s, scientists were already noticing that if you activated the immune system through bacteria, in some cases it could fight off a tumor. Needless to say, the risks outweighed the benefits in those cases but we've honed our understanding of the interactions of cancer and immunity to provide new targeted therapeutics. These therapies can include drugs to prevent the tumor from evading the immune system, like taking the parking brake off of your car so that you can drive it forward. These drugs are called checkpoint blockade inhibitors. Cancer immunotherapies also include engineered cells that have been made from a patient's own immune cells to specifically target cancer cells in a therapeutic known as CAR T cells. This knowledge of the interactions between cancer cells and our immune cells has also turned into new diagnostics. Even further, our understanding of the immune system to infectious diseases has been linked to other debilitating conditions. Vaccinations against human, papilloma, human papillomavirus, or HPV, are estimated to have saved thousands of lives by preventing the virus from spreading and causing damage to our DNA that leads to cancer and are projected to help almost eliminate cervical cancer in our children's lifetimes. Recent work has linked the Epstein-Barr virus, a virus that has already been associated with blood and gastrointestinal cancers, to an autoimmune nervous disease called multiple sclerosis. There are no tr current cures for MS, but what if we could prevent it from ever happening in the first place? The nervous system is a place where we once thought was devoid of most immune activity. 
but we have since learned it is absolutely teeming with immune cells. Targeting inflammation after traumatic brain injury could help improve outcomes by preventing damaging immune responses after that tissue injury. Alternatively, immune cells called microglia can help with a process known as synaptic pruning during the development of our brain, of our nervous system, which prunes away the linkages between neurons to really fine tune our brains. Pathology in this process might lead to different psychological disorders. For example, we know that some psychological disorders can be hereditary, and scientists have actually associated different genetic variations of an immune protein to an increased risk of schizophrenia, though the research, of course, is still ongoing. Knowing the mechanism by which these diseases are triggered would lead to the ability to detect risk factors and diagnose early, along with developing therapeutics and preventatives. Our immune system is immensely powerful. It can save us and it can kill us. In some individuals, their immune cells turn against them in a phenomenon known as autoimmunity. This can manifest in a variety of ways, including painful skin lesions, severe gastrointestinal dysfunction, debilitating joint pain, hair loss and broad-based pathologies, and can be life-threatening. Through working with patients and understanding the causes of these diseases, scientists have made treatments to block this excessive inflammation. Engineers have even created prototype tolerizing vaccines, where we educate our immune system to not attack our own cells, protecting our neurons in multiple sclerosis, our insulin-producing cells in type 1 diabetes. These applications can even extend to allergies, calming the immune system down to not overreact to peanuts, pollen, or animals. Instead of taking broad-based antihistamines, wouldn't it be great if you could have a specific treatment that just told your immune system, it's spring, those are trees, you are fine. When we are injured, our immune cells are our first responders, and they persist for a long time after they have worked to fight off any potential infection. Did you know that by targeting our immune cells, we can actually promote wound healing and tissue regeneration? The signals that immune cells produce can directly interact with stem cells. These stem cells can then turn into a variety of different types of cells, then turning into a variety of different types of tissues. Muscle, fat, bone, nerve. Our immune cells can talk to these stem cells and we can modify that communication by using engineered biomaterials. Just like a scaffold to support building a house, engineers can make scaffolds to support the growth of tissues and organs. Instead of putting notes in a blueprint, we provide cues in the form of different pharmaceuticals and materials to direct immune cells on how to behave. Those will then shape the formation of tissue from stem cells. Specific proteins are secreted by immune cells that have been linked to muscle cells fusing to form our muscle fibers and nerve cells forming the connections they need to communicate. Other molecules have been implicated in pathology, such as scar tissue formation or excessive inflammation and degradation of surrounding tissue. Understanding these interactions will allow us to design precise materials to manipulate those communications and build back missing or non-functional organs. Even beyond our own tissues and organs, the immune system mediates the success and failure of replacements of broken body parts that are called medical devices. Hip replacements, reconstructive implants, heart valves, dental implants, and even the needles from an insulin pump or a glucose monitor. All of these, all of these devices have a limited lifetime. Needles of glucose monitors need to be moved every few days. Knee replacements and cosmetic implants can lose their function and build up scar tissue or inflammation that damages even further. This is because our immune system is recognizing this material as foreign and not a part of our own bodies. Engineers have used multiple approaches to developing new materials 
and coatings that extend the lifetime of medical devices and minimize any potential harm. Large chemical libraries that are created by generating a portfolio of different modifications to minimize inflammation and scarring. This library approach involves screening many candidate molecules to identify the best one. Alternatively, researchers have also used inspiration from natural processes. For example, co-opting a pathway of our own cells that they use to calm down immune cells. Medical devices have benefited from this local manipulation of immune responses to extend the lifetime of these implants, and we can expect to see even more to come. As we create these new technologies, engineers are also designing ways to evaluate human biology without the humans. So-called organ-on-a-chip technologies are recapitulations of human tissues and organs that can fit in a Petri dish. While of course we don't have a human on a chip just yet, being able to replicate an immune system or an organ in a dish would open the door and pave the way for designing and testing therapeutics in a more high throughput manner, decreasing the need for animal testing and moving to patient specific precision medicine. Being able to evaluate how an individual person might respond to treatment. Could you imagine testing in a Petri dish which vaccine formulation would produce the best immune response? Rapid design and evaluation of healthcare tools is necessary for the changing world we live in. Through understanding the science, the biology of the immune system, we can create rationally designed next generation health technologies. This study of understanding and engineering immunity has been dubbed immunoengineering and is taking off at lightning speeds. Through programs such as the US's new ARPA-H initiative, focused on funding of next generation health ideas and technologies, these innovative concepts, along with other cutting edge fields in science and society, can be applied to human health and further developed. Who knows what lies around the corner if someone is given the resources to explore a bold idea. Of course, to make accessible technologies, we need to make sure that we think of the world as we do it. Keep the patient, keep the end user in mind. If we as a people want to make an accessible technology, put it in the hands of the user and make them a part of the team. Young, old, male, female, African, European, Asian, Middle Eastern, Pacific, South, Latin, North American, Caribbean, indigenous, immigrant, healthy, chronically ill, rich, poor, and everything in between. This goes for clinical studies, patients, and volunteers as integral parts of the science. Involve them in the design and the implementation and allow their voices and the voices of the scientists in areas where these technologies are being applied to be heard. Ultimately, if we do not consider all stakeholders, we are doomed to fail. But if we work together and support innovation in areas full of promise, we could see revolutionary advances through diverse thinking. Thank you.